We welcome you to this next series of discussions about Isaiah. This roundtable uh, series uh, is about the writings of Isaiah as found in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon. Uh, I have three colleagues with me here today as we start our discussion. We have Terry Sink, who is uh, one of our junior members, as we call him on our faculty, seasoned though he is. Ann Madsen, well known uh, with many students who have been in her Isaiah classes. And Ray Huntington, a great scholar of the scriptures. Welcome. Glad to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. We're scheduled today to start with chapters 7 and 8 of Isaiah. These are chapters that are also found in the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi 17 and 18. And there's a wonderful but somewhat confusing mix of history and prophecy in these chapters. Uh, Terry, why don't you tell us a little bit about the historical setting for these chapters? Well, what's happening is uh, the nation of Israel and the nation of Syria have combined and they're, they're threatening Judah. And the, the king of Judah, Ahaz, is very concerned about this. And so Isaiah goes and counsels him and, and uh, basically tells him not to worry. Uh, and, it's, and, and he asks, uh, uh, Isaiah offers to give him a sign. Isaiah, or Ahaz refuses, but then Isaiah gives him the sign anyway. And I think uh, I'd like to share a, 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 a statement by uh, uh, Brother Oaks about this. Uh, and this illustrates uh, his, his statement, this, this chapter uh, 7 and 8 illustrate this, this statement very well. He says, The book of Isaiah contains numerous prophe prophecies that seem to have multiple fulfillments. One seems to include the people of Isaiah's day or the circumstances of the next generation. Another meaning, often symbolic, seems to refer to the events in the reading of time, when Jerusalem was destroyed and her people scattered after the crucifixion of the Son of God. Still another meaning or fulfillment of the same prophecy seems to relate to the events attending the second coming of the Savior. The fact that many of these prophecies can have multiple meanings underscores the importance of our seeking revelation from the Holy Ghost to help us interpret them. As Nephi says, the words of Isaiah are plain unto all those who are filled with the spirit of prophecy. Very good. So we've got here in these chapters material that people in Isaiah's day could relate to. Yet those that were listening to the Savior or Peter or reading the epistles of Paul, they could connect to some of this because they could see where some of it had fulfillment in their time. And then those of us in the last days. Now, if we go back here, let's just concentrate, first of all, a little bit on the time of Isaiah. You said Syria and Israel, the northern tribes there, were attacking Judah. Why would they do that? I mean, particularly, why would Israelites attack, attack fellow Israelites in Judah? Is there any logic to this invasion? Actually, there is. Um, it, oh, go ahead. I was just going to read go what ahead. it said. Uh, let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves. Well, why? Why would they want to do it? I mean, other than just possession. Is there something more? The, the, the bully on the block uh, right now is Assyria. And they're not just a bully, they're a menacing bully. And uh, their, their shadow is looming over um, Israel, the northern kingdom. It's looming over uh, Syria. And uh, they, Syria and, Damas uh, Syria and Israel, have formed a coalition, a coalition to try and stop Assyria from its movement. Okay. But they need Judah to help them. So this is where maybe looking at your maps in the back of your Bible would help. If you can find Assyria. Uh, in Mesopotamia, also known as Babylon, uh, Iraq today. They were expanding their empire, working their way towards Egypt, and what stands in the way there are countries like Syria and Israel, and then further to the south, Judah. And of course, Syria and, and Israel about to be attacked. They sense this coming. They'd like to get everybody in the region to put up a united front, but Judah doesn't want to. 
And so they try to force Judah to do this. Now part of the complexity, it's, it's actually a fairly simple dialogue going on in here in these few, first few verses. It's just that different nomenclature is used for, for countries. Just like as, as reporters might be talking about our nation, they'll talk about the United States, the government, the, the administration, the White House says. I mean, you know, the White House yeah, doesn't really talk, but it sound. becomes a symbol. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a similar thing here that shows the three primary countries involved, Syria, Israel and Judah, what were the capital cities or regions, what were the dominant tribes or groups, who were the kings or ruling houses there, so that you'll see, although it sounds at first like he's talking about seven, eight, or ten different nations, it's really just three of them, but using different names for these countries. Now, Terry, you, you mentioned that uh, Judah was getting beat, uh, Ahaz was discouraged, the prophet was called to go to him and, and, and give him a message uh, and, and offer him a sign. Uh, why don't we read here, would somebody uh, read for us here a, a little bit about this particular sign starting in verse 10. Terry, would you read sure. that for us? Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. When he says house of David, he's, he's, he's referring to, to Ahaz. He's the king of, of Judah at this time. And a descendant of David. And a descendant of David, right. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, let's stop right there. So, here's, we're asked not to go to the Lord and ask for a sign, but here the prophet is saying, King, ask for a sign, whatever you want to. And he says, well, I don't want to tempt, or as it says in the footnotes, I want to test, I don't want to try, I don't want to bother the Lord. Uh, we understand from later material in the historical context, he actually had already apparently decided he wanted to form he an alliance a, with Assyria. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he doesn't want this prophet yeah. telling him how to run his kingdom, so he doesn't want to bother the Lord and have this accountability. But in essence, Isaiah says, well, the Lord's going to give you a sign anyway. Behold, you know, look, this maiden, this virgin shall conceive. She will bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Actually, it's four little signs there. Uh, she will conceive, she'll bear a son, she'll call his name Emmanuel, and then it goes on to say that uh, before he's old enough in verse 16 to know good from evil, in other words, before he reaches accountability, these two nations will be laid waste. So within about 10 years from now, here's a woman, she'll have a son, this will be his name, and before the lad is old enough to know right from wrong, this problem will be taken care of. Now that's the setting of it in Isaiah's day. But how might it fit in with a setting, say, some 700 years later? And very obviously, we read this thinking about Emmanuel, God with us, uh, in Hebrew. And what does that mean? God with us. Okay. And so um, we think of Christ in this setting. Um, but obviously Ahaz wouldn't have been thinking of Christ at all. That's right. And it wouldn't have been a sign for him in his time. No. And of course scholars like to emphasize that and, and, and maybe downplay the messianic fulfillment of it. But Matthew picks up on this and highlights yes. it mm -hmm. in his gospel account directed to, to a Jewish community how this maiden would have a son. And although she was commanded by the angel to actually call him Jesus, he was in reality God Emmanuel, knows. as you said, right. God, this God in the flesh among us, with us. Yeah, his whole existence fulfills that name. And in fact, he is God with us. And so, there you go. Well, I, mean, I think even in the historical context here, <clears throat> here, here's the sign, which is God telling Ahaz this, this threatening, menacing force, I'll take care of for you. Yeah. Okay? In the yeah. same way, um, Isaiah is also saying that uh, any threatening emanate, or any any threatening menacing force in our lives, in a sense, 
call it spiritual death, whatever you'd like. Um, Emmanuel is going to take care of that. God, Jesus, who came to this earth to provide that's, that's, salvation that's for us. That's an important point. And yeah. you're, you're doing right there what Nephi would encourage yeah. us to do, to take Isaiah and lighten it into <clears throat> ourselves. But if we move to that third stage of possible fulfillment of Isaiah's word, this multiple fulfillment dimension of his prophetic calling, is there a particular way that we in the last days might need that kind of sign and comfort and reassurance mm -hmm. that God is with us? How, how might that apply in our setting? So you're thinking of Assyria like the, <laughs> yeah. the threatening of the times that we live in. And of course we live in these uh, dreadful, chaotic times with uh, imminent threats all around us all the time. I mean, even now, as we think of terrorists, uh, that's a whole different kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. this immediacy that they felt. Mm -hmm. Assyria, you know, you, the, not all countries are created equal in the Bible. When mm -hmm. you read Moab, you read Edom, you read Syria, they're not the menace that Assyria and Babylon and at times Egypt, Egypt are. Right. So if we think of those big empires and then these tiny little countries that are try almost like city-states trying to survive with the menace right on their doorstep, well, we have that same kind of menace today in our, because of the world, yeah. because of the world situation. And I, you know, I think too, on a real practical level, when you look at the life of the Savior in the New Testament, what was he doing? He was laying hands on, he was healing, he was, uh, he, he was lifting people from this stage to this stage. He was always making people better. And, and I think in the same way, this Emmanuel, this God with us, is still with us. And that he still has the ability to lay his hands on our marriage and make it better, on our family to make it better, on us to make us better. And he still does that. He's still very much with us. He's never left us, actually. Yeah. So we we leave him us. rather than yeah. he leaving us. Yeah. Isaiah makes that so clear over and over again. Yeah. That we withdraw. He's always there. Talks about his hand being stretched out. Uh, his anger not being turned away, but his hand stretched out still. And as you're reading, you'll come across that phrase over and over and over again. It's there. He loves us. His, he stretches out his and, hand. And I'm, yes, you're right. And I'm sure we'll talk about it because sometimes it's a hand of judgment. Sometimes it's a hand of mercy. Yes. But his hand is always out there and the invitation attached to it to come and, 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 and receive his help and his guidance. Well, do, any other ideas that you feel would be relevant for our viewers here? Uh, there's one other point I'd like to highlight here in, in, in verse 8, part of the promise here that we kind of lose sight of is, is, uh, is one of the scattering of Israel, yeah. particularly the tribe of Ephraim yeah. there in verse 8. Yes. He talks about the head of Syria, or the capital city is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, their, their king. But within three score and five years shall Ephraim, this dominant tribe of, of the northern kingdom, be broken and it shall not be a people. So you get a sense that within 65 years, in other words, within the lifetime of some of those uh, listening to Isaiah, these northern tribes, particularly Ephraim, are going to start to not be a cohesive nation and people, but to start to scatter among the nations of the earth. And, and so one point for us to remember with Isaiah is that he is the last great prophet to have all of Israel together. They had been with Jacob, but his family had gone to Egypt, Moses had brought them out, Joshua brought them in the land. But right now here in the days of Isaiah, they start to scatter and he even looks to the scattering. Well, let's turn here to chapter 8. Uh, as we read in the heading of our LDS edition of this, it, it indicates that Christ uh, shall be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense and some other insights here into this particular chapter. But when you start reading this chapter, what are probably some of the first things that come to mind or echoes or sounds that you hear as you start reading chapter 8 of Isaiah? Well, you begin to learn about Isaiah's family, the names of his children, Maharshalal Hashbaz. Uh, we discussed earlier how that would not be the kind of name that you'd want to give a child unless it really had a reason. And in this case, <laughs> it did. Um, 
Are you just talking about the length <laughs> or, the, or the meaning of it? Or both. both? <laughs> what does it mean? Do you remember? Both, yes. Uh, in fact, look in your footnotes and it will tell you what it means. I think that's a good thing for everybody to be able to do is look down and, and see. Is it, is it on the footnote? Of right at the eight, bottom eight, there. Eight, yeah, what does eight, it say? Eight, eight. To speed to the spoil, he hasteneth to the prey. So there's going to be war. <laughs> yeah, little pillager here is his, yeah. uh, not the most complimentary name to give, and it's a very long name. In fact, for you trivia buffs, it's the longest name in the Bible. Uh, but you know, it's, it's an important name because as this young boy goes out on the street with that name, they're going to be repeating it with that, uh, with that image in mind. And who is it that's going to speed to the spoil? Well, it's going to be Assyria. He's, he's going to, number one, he's going to devastate Syria and Israel um, in the process of sort of protecting Judah. But at the same time, Assyria is coming after Judah as well because of their wickedness and their iniquities. They, they need it's, to repent or yeah. they're going to be humbled as well. That's right. In the chapter before we met uh, Isaiah's other son when he goes with his father, isn't Shear Yashuv with him when he goes to meet Ahaz? Uh, so now we've, with the prophetess, we've got the whole family together. At least yeah. the we ones know, that we, we know. Uh, some of the family that we know of. Right. So he's not just a, one person out there. We know his, his wife and we know the names of his children. And it's interesting, those names are, are so symbolic. One of them is talking about the scattering, and the other one is talking about the gathering, which are the, the two major themes of yeah. Isaiah's writings. Yeah, yeah. important yeah, point. That's a good point. And Isaiah says, uh, very straight out and plain to us, I, and behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. So he knew who he was, he knew who they were. It's like if we know who we are, <laughs> it's, uh, he knew that, they, that their names were important, and that they were prophecies, that they would come true. Now one term that shows up in, in verse 6 here that we often uh, wonder about is this, this Shiloh. Mm -hmm. These waters of Shiloh are speaking softly. I mean, is he really speaking softly or hard here, Ray? What's he, what's he doing sort here? Sort of both. But I think what, what he's saying to, to his people and really saying to us as well is that um, both Israel and Judah have made some choices. And uh, one of the choices that they have made is they ref they've, refused to, they've, they've refused to follow Christ, to accept uh, Jehovah as their God. And know what he says uh, here to them, verse 6, For as much as, for as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly. That, uh, that the waters of Shiloh here, uh, those are, that's imagery of Christ. He's the living water. He's the well of salvation. And, and, and they go softly. Isn't there something in that? It's just beautiful. Yeah, that is beautiful. Softly, kind, tender. And yet they, they, they reject it and are going off with these political alliances all. And then here in verse 7, well, if they reject the gentle flowing waters, the soft water, what will I send against them here? These waters of the river, referring to the Euphrates, when, and it, it, those are great flood waters. I mean, it brings boulders and trees uh, out of these narrow gorges as it feeds down into Mesopotamia. And so instead of this gentle little spring they get this torrent of flood. I mean, up to the neck. I mean, you just, you know if you've got this kind of torrent of water coming, it's up to your neck. You're, 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 you're moving. You're, you're, you've got the message. It's a great example of the metaphors that he uses, you know, because you start out with, and you use it for different things. Water can be soft and flowing, mm -hmm. or it can be frightening that you're going, I'm a swimmer, and if I had water up to my neck in a flood, I'd be frightened to death. I'd know I could get on top of it as a swimmer, but you know, most people are not swimmers and you get water to your neck. And especially if there's logs and debris in yes. the water that might hit you. Not, yeah, Tsunamis. even a good swimmer would, would, would be terrified <laughs> we with under, that. We've seen all those pictures of tsunamis, so oh, we have an excellent. image to look at you know, when we think about what this metaphor that he's using to teach us something. And in Isaiah's day, these, this was literally fulfilled. Uh, Assyria comes out of the north, it destroys 
the, the nation of Israel, it destroys Syria, and it comes right up to the, to the gates of Jerusalem, and, and they're, they're just talk about up water to up neck. to the neck. So yeah. another one, yeah, yeah, how it might just come, just look like you're about ready to go down, about ready to drown, and then and, and, and you're just barely preserved. Now, like the theme that we talked about in the previous chapter, there is an all-present one there. He will be with us, but we have different ways of connecting with him. And here's another famous passage that's off-quoted from this chapter. Uh, Terry, could you read verse 14 for us and, and help us try to understand this important verse? And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a stone of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin and for a snare unto the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And what, that, what that's talking about is, is it's, there's a kind of a dichotomy. On the one hand, the Lord can be a, a stone in which we build our foundation. Uh, we're all familiar with the parable of the man who builds his house upon the, the sure place, the stone. On the other hand, if we reject his counsel, if we refuse to obey his commandments, he becomes a stumbling block to us and can, call, can cause our downfall. So the same piece of granite there could be a, a, a stumbling stone that you trip on and fall, Absolutely. or it could be a building block that you build like as a step or a protective wall or, or something like that. Yeah, or the house built upon a rock. Right. Right. Yeah. In yeah. essence, this, this people that Isaiah is talking to have a choice. It's either build your cornerstone uh, on that solid rock of Christ or let that rock be that which you trip over. Mm -hmm. Because you will ultimately, if you fight against it. So. Good. Well, Anne, if you were trying to summarize these, these two chapters in both their historical and prophetic setting with all these names and these kind of <laughs> sort of a, a historical overlay, but there's a deeper sort of spiritual level that we want to put out of it, pull out of it, what, what would you say is the importance of these two chapters and why are I they so I, significant? I hope I can do that. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. <laughs> Tall order. Well, I think the political uh, situation is a just, it's a little mini showing what Assyria is doing. It's coming down to these three little countries who've decided, or at least two of them, decided they're going to fight and they're going to stand against Assyria, which was really kind of foolish. Assyria was so huge and so feared. Um, Judah saying, no, they wouldn't, but at the same time, King Ahaz making a deal with Assyria and then that was pretty much selling out the other two little countries, so they didn't have to worry about that anymore. Um, and then underlying all of this, using these beautiful metaphors, talking to us about a king that can be depended upon, the Lord himself, that we're supposed to be depending upon, that quiet water. Uh, there's, there are times later in Isaiah where it's as if God and the Assyrian king are buying it and when they when they talk they say our king can beat your king <laughs> and uh, and we know that's foolishness because the king of Israel was the creator God was Jehovah uh, we also meet the family of Isaiah in these chapters we learn that their names are prophecies and that that's significant there's going to be a gathering but there'll also be a return um, Isaiah calls his wife a prophetess. It's a very interesting uh, name. I had a student in one of my classes say, the reason she's called a prophetess is because the sons she bore were prophecies. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Maybe that's possible. <laughs> but in some ways, I think we can think that he honored her by calling her that name. Um, she was the wife of a prophet. And Isaiah was one of the great prophets. And I think as we study him even more, we'll find out he was a compassionate, wonderful father. I mean, he, he all through, he will, uh, there will be metaphors about childbirth, that he would have nothing, he wouldn't know that if he hadn't sat at the bedside. They didn't have bedside, sorry, wrong cultural thing. <laughs> um, he hadn't sat and watched his wife give birth. And this kind of sweetness and kindness and uh, suffering over the sins of the, of the people he's declaring to them. And, and as he sees the consequence of their sins, you feel his good heart. 
and I think uh, these chapters introduce us to this man and his family in a uh, and open up that for us and also show us that that Assyria is going to be coming on strong and be a huge uh, influence during all of Isaiah's life. Isaiah is going to see the northern kingdom taken away, the first of the gathering, or the yes, scattering. scattering. Yes. Well, you presented a beautiful, but, but not a common view that we would have of Isaiah, of this kind of loving, fatherly uh, family man. We think of him as a stern kind of uh, preacher on a stump, uh, bringing and promising mm -hmm. chastisement and all of that. But he did, he saw the big picture. He seemed to understand that as much as Israel and Judah were wicked, and he could give some specific prophecies about timing of certain events that were going to be benchmark events in their history as far as the house of Israel is concerned. He could also see beyond that to the first coming and as we emphasize different ways that we might connect to it in preparation for the second coming of the Savior so that uh, we can appreciate why we, we might want to take a look at these twice, not only when we're studying the Old Testament, but also when we're studying the Book of Mormon. Thank you very much for your comments. It's been a good discussion. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.